Grace and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning's Gospel reason, reading puts in front of us one of the great paradoxes in Scripture. First off, we have, we have one truth, and that is that God is in control completely. We see that in this text that the story of what God was going to do from the time that he promises, first of all, to Adam and Eve that his son would come, born of woman, and crush the serpent's head, is all in his control. Everything is happening according to Scripture, according to that word that God gave to his people, according to his plan. It's all working out. He puts this plan in place, and now here we see Christ taking the place of us, his people. Fulfilling everything that happened in the Old Testament, tracing back the steps of the people of Israel, who took all these steps in sin, Christ takes them perfect. We see him going, just as the people of Israel did, the promised chosen ones, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and onward, from that promised land area there, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, all the way to Egypt, where they were held captive, and we know that he's going to return. Everything is in his control. He knew what was going to happen. He lays it out, and all these things happen according to his plan. His word is fulfilled. That's one truth that we see. God is in control. He's doing everything. And yet, the other truth is that he puts this plan into the hands of sinful man. And he allows us to be part of this story, part of this work. Jesus is just an infant at this stage. He can't walk. He can't talk. He is completely under the care of Mary and Joseph. It's amazing to think about. God who is in control, God who created the heavens and the earth, here now, that second person of the Trinity, is weak and helpless and puts himself into the care of man. God could have protected Jesus. The Father could have protected him any way he wanted to. He could have killed Herod with a thought, whatever his plan was, but instead, he uses man. He comes to Joseph in a dream, and he says, take that child and go to Egypt. And so while God is in complete control, he puts his work into the hands of man. And here we see Joseph, who we don't know much of in Scripture, We see him be that guardian and that protector of his legal son, Jesus, whom he named because that's what the angel told him to name him, because Jesus' son would save the people from their sins. But at this point, Jesus is in the complete care of Joseph and Mary. Joseph, the guardian of Christ, leads Jesus to Egypt, away from Herod, away from the destruction that is going to happen there in Bethlehem, That sad story of what Herod did because he wanted to protect himself, as if he could. And then when Herod is dead, word comes to Joseph and he takes Jesus back. Jesus, the Son of God, retracing the traps and the steps of the people of Israel, doing it perfectly, and yet he only does it because of the care that Joseph and Mary have for him. It's an amazing paradox. God is in complete control. It's in his hands. And yet he puts himself and puts that complete control into reliance upon others. Now what does that have to do with us? Well, we know Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so he still does the same thing today. He is in complete control. The gates of hell will not prevail against his church. That's what he tells Peter and all the other disciples. And yet, he takes the church and he puts it in our hands. Just as he took Christ, his only son, and put him in the hands of Mary and Joseph. Dear Christians, that's a joy for us. It's a joy because we know that God is in control. We know the gates of hell cannot prevail against his church. There is nothing that can tear you away from the love of Christ. Neither height, nor depth, nor angel, nor demons, nor things present, nor things to come can separate us from the love of God. And that is a truth. And yet he puts the care of that church into the hands of sinful people. 
like me and like you. He allows us to be part of that story, part of his redemption. Luther has a beautiful prayer that he lays out for pastors to pray. It's called his sacristy prayer. And where it comes from originally is Luther was, he was lecturing on Genesis chapter 27, the story of Jacob and Rebekah, their deception of Isaac. And his point is that even in spite of our unwillingness and our weakness, God is faithful. And he says this, he says, every leader in the church should pray in this manner. Lord God, you've appointed me in the church as a bishop and pastor. And you see how unfit I am to attend to such a great and difficult office. If it had not been for your help, I would long since have ruined everything. Therefore, I call upon you. But of course, I want to put my mouth and heart to use. I shall teach the people, and I myself shall learn and meditate diligently on thy word. Use me as thy instrument, and do not forsake me. For if I'm alone, I shall easily destroy everything. Well, dear Christians, that's a wonderful prayer for pastors. But it's also a prayer that we all can pray. Luther understood that this great duty was given to him, and yet if it was up to him alone, he would have ruined the church a long time ago. And dear Christians, that's our comfort. 2,000 years later, the church still stands. And we know the people that have gone before us, and they were miserable sinners just like you, just like me. And yet the church was in God's hands. Just as the whole world was in the hands of Christ, even though he put himself in the hands of Joseph and Mary. The church is in his hands, and yet he chooses to use me, and he chooses to use you. He has used others before us, and he will use others after us. But right now, at this point, he gives that care of the church to you and to me. Of course, at the same time, we know it's in his hands. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. And so we pray like Luther, Lord, we know we are unfit, and we know that if it was up to us alone, all things would fall apart. We would make a ruin of everything, not just in the church, but in our families, in our own sinful lives. And yet, Lord, we call upon you. We want God to use our mouths, our hearts, our time, our talents to be the place where his church is, to be the place where his forgiveness goes out, because that's what the church is centered around. It's centered around the forgiveness that only Christ can give to us. Only Christ, because he's the only one that could do all the things that he did, fulfilling in the place of Israel and in the place of you and of me all that we cannot do. And he gives you that forgiveness. But now he allows us to be part of bringing that forgiveness to others. Dear Christians, that's a joy. It might not make sense, but that's what a paradox is. The one truth is that God is in complete control. His church will stand. His forgiveness will be there until the day he returns and raises the dead. And yet, he puts the church into our care. Just as he put Joseph into the care of Mary and Joseph. Joseph put Jesus in the care of Mary and Joseph. He does the same for you. He gives you that forgiveness and you get to be stewards of it. Handing it out in your families, to your spouse, to your children. Always in God's care, his complete control, and yet he allows us to be the mouth and the hands of that forgiveness. Dear Christians, that's the joy at Christmas. We have a God who takes on flesh, who comes into this sinful world, who makes himself one of us. He is not far from us, but he is near. He is always in control, and yet he allows us into that story too. He allows us to be the church, to be those who take Christ and bring him to the nations, and to bring that peace that only he can give to us. We get to bring it to others. Now may that peace of God that surpasses all of our understanding, may it guard, may it keep your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ, your Lord. Amen. This time we